Hey everybody, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I really do want to thank you for popping in on this and I really do want to encourage you uh, to post some questions in the Q&A because that's kind of the fun part of being in a live uh, webinar is that you get to do that. Uh, just uh, want to tell you just real quick a little bit about myself, a little bit about what we're going to do in this webinar. Uh, I've, if you've not been to any of my webinars before, uh, I'm Tracy Wallace. I am a, let's see if I can get all of this right here, Microsoft Certified uh, Azure Solution Architect Expert and uh, several other little uh, certifications that kind of fall under that as well. Uh, I've been working with the Azure for uh, pretty much since it came out. I've been working in the Microsoft environment and teaching it and developing and, and building stuff in it since uh, the mid 1990s, and uh, I've got lots of gray hair, so I was actually in IT even before that. All right, um, that's enough about me. I do want to tell you a little bit about uh, the topic, and the reason I want I, I picked this topic is because personally, I think it is extremely important, and I think it's important because <clears throat> I, I really, if, if you look at cloud maturity models. I know it's, it's not, there's another maturity model, that's not what I'm talking about. But as organizations move their workloads into the cloud, uh, typically they move first into uh, infrastructure as a service, lift and shift, right? And complete control of uh, really everything. And then ideally as organizations mature, they move into the platform. But one of the problems, frankly, uh, out of the gate and for several years in the Azure environment, <clears throat> is that you have these public endpoints for your platform services. So whether it's a SQL Server, whether it's a uh, storage account, web app, uh, whatever it is, if you're on the platform, there is a public endpoint. And for me and for many others, that's always been a little bit of an issue from a security standpoint, right? Because oftentimes I don't in any way, shape or form want to have my services exposed like that. And there, there's kind of been a variety of ways that that's been handled uh, by Microsoft. Some good, some not as good. Started out, for example, the uh, Azure SQL database and Azure SQL Server actually did have a built-in firewall, but a lot of other things didn't. And <clears throat> long story short, that brings us to a much better, if I must admit, a little bit more confusing than I would like it to be, uh, architecture, which is the private endpoints. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so without further ado, <clears throat> I'm gonna move into the topics. All right, so we have uh, three topics that we're gonna cover. I'm gonna talk about platform endpoints, which I kind of already talked about. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about service endpoints. Uh, and then I'm gonna go into a demonstration. And I've got an architecture built uh, where I've got a web app that uses actually uh, the combination of storage and uh, SQL Server database and also Cosmos DB, all of which is going to get through uh, private links through private service endpoints. All right, now for the fun part, and I'm not sure how well this is going to work, but I'm going to try it. Let's see here. I'm um, actually uh, uh, awesome planning on my part. Uh, I'm going to see about sharing from the second machine that I actually much prefer to share from. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing there. And let's start sharing my screen here. Actually, we'll just share straight to whiteboard. OK. So here's my Zoom whiteboard, and I've got my uh, handy dandy tablet, which I never, I, I actually have a <clears throat> tablet that can, connects to my computer, and I never think about that one. All right, and uh, public endpoints, right? So if I think about a public endpoint, let's say that I've got, oh, that's terrible. Hold on, we have to, we have to stop that. Let's go ahead and share my actual screen. There we go. Bring up Microsoft's whiteboard, much better. Again, sorry, didn't think about this till right at the end that I, I'm just so used to drawing with my uh, stylus now that, all right, there we go. Waste a little bit of your time, but not too much. All right, here we go. 
let's say I've got a service. Okay. And this is SQL Server. Now, every service, every platform service, SQL Server, Storage, Cosmos DB, Web Apps, Function Apps, well, maybe Function Apps, uh, have a public endpoint. Okay, so that is connected to the internet. Now, I can put up in SQL Server, I can put up a firewall. Okay, but even if I've got other services or even infrastructure, so uh, this is a web app and this is a uh, virtual machine, they can connect to it, but they're actually going to go out through that public endpoint. And frankly, that's pretty terrible. And uh, that is the original architecture. But again, that, that is, is not what I would consider to be a great architecture. But it is important to understand. Very simple drawing. But that's what you have with all the platform services. And again, a platform service, if you're not familiar with the concept, is where you're not running your own virtual machine. You're not running your own operating system. The cloud provider, in this case, Azure, is taking care of that for you. And that's really what we're looking at today. Uh, and, and we're going to look at three and maybe a fourth one as well. OK, so SQL Server, Web App, they're all uh, pointed out. And by the way, also, even if that VM wanted to get to the Web App, it's going to go out and, and kind of do the exact same thing. All right, now let's uh, erase all of that. You would think I'd be able to do this. There we go. There. Okay. Now, with private endpoints, what we now have, okay, we still have the same things. Okay, so I can still draw these guys out. But now, what we have. Behind it, man, I love the fact that it takes my horrible drawings and makes them squares. All right, so we still have, let's say, SQL Server. We still have a web app, and we still have a virtual machine. But all of these can have a presence in a virtual network. Okay. Now, a virtual machine has always got a presence in a virtual network. Right, it's always in a subnet in a virtual network. But now I can create these private endpoints, also referred right now to as private links, and I can now have they don't have to be in different subnets, but now I can have these so that each one of these services actually has an endpoint in the virtual network, right? And so now if this were, because I am exceedingly lazy, let's say 10.0.0.0 slash 16, right? What that would mean if you're not familiar with that notation is that uh, all of the local IP addresses, so the non-internet IP addresses uh, are gonna be under 10.0. something, okay? It's just, uh, it's called CIDR notation. Okay, and so let's say this is uh, 10.0.0.0 slash 24. This is 10.0.0.0 slash 24 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24. Now what's gonna happen is that each one of these uh, systems, each one of these resources is going to have a private IP address. So for example, SQL servers may be 10.0.2.4 and the web app may have 10.0.1.4 and the VM may have 10.0.0.4. Okay. And now, 
we have this connectivity that doesn't go outside of Azure. In fact, even though there's still going to be a public DNS and that public DNS is still going to be resolvable, it's not reachable, or at least you can set it to not be reachable. Right? And this is the concept behind private endpoints. It's saying, okay, I'm going to take these platform services where I've always had to have these services uh, sitting out and having that public IP address and, and the public, publicly accessible endpoint, right? Well, now what we want to do is say, look, I want to lock that down, right? Whether you're looking at a support service, right? So SQL Server. SQL Server, generally speaking, you don't want that having a public endpoint. You don't want, there, there should be typically no reason for that, right? That's supporting whatever your web app is, whatever your workload is, but it's in the background, okay? Uh, you know, the VM, of course, is going to be local, right? And then the web app, that could be either way. In fact, the web app could still provide a public endpoint as well. So I could have a public IP address on the web app. So it's still providing that kind of public access, but now the services that are supporting it are behind it. Now, the way I've drawn this out is a little bit misleading. All right, so I could have other services here. And for example, maybe this is Cosmos TV. Whoa. Sometimes, sometimes it's good when this figures out my writing. Sometimes it's a little aggressive. Let's say, let's see. Cosmos DB. Okay. I can have more than one service, more than one platform service or resource in the same virtual network. In fact, as you will see in the demonstration, I'm going to have uh, actually three of the services in the same virtual network as are in the same subnet as the virtual machine. Okay. Now, a couple things about this architecture. The cool thing about this architecture is that it is, in fact, transitive. Okay, so if I have another virtual network and that virtual network is peered uh, to the virtual network that I've got all of this uh, connectivity in, uh, then my virtual machines or even other services in that other virtual network can access those, right? So if I've got a VM down here that's attached to that VNet and it needs to get to SQL Server, it actually can. Now there is one interesting little caveat to this. Okay, and that is that most of these services, this is where, okay, it can get a little bit more complicated and where I may mess up part of the demo, okay. Um, <clears throat> these services are typically accessed uh, through encrypted, uh, encryption in transit, if you will, right? So SQL Server is uh, using encrypted TDS, your Cosmos DB, your storage account, they're using typically HTTPS, which is associated with a certificate, okay? Now, the one thing with that is that certificate is tied to their public DNS name. So what you need is I need some way of saying, okay, I know locally, uh, I want to access SQL Server through that 10.0.2.4, if this were the case. But what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to access that by whatever, I'll say SQL dot, and it's database. I'm just going to say data because I don't want you to watch me write all that out, dot windows dot net. Okay. So um, and the reason why I need that, and that's a T, not a triangle. Okay. The reason why I need that is because, again, when I connect up to SQL Server and it says, okay, uh, you know, this is encrypted, got a certificate, what's a certificate say? Well, if I'm just connecting to 10.0.2.4, then that's not actually going to work. And uh, so what you need is you need some kind of uh, DNS. Now, uh, what you can do is you can set up private DNS. Okay, you can have an Azure private DNS zone, and you can have these register in that zone, and you can have the zones uh, linked to the DNS for your virtual network, okay, and that'll work fine. Or if you have a, your own custom DNS server, then you're going to have to add in uh, the appropriate uh, DNS entries. You can even do it at the virtual machine level in your host file, 
right? But you're going to need in most cases, uh, something a little different than just the internal name. And in fact, uh, what's gonna happen as you will see uh, when I implement this is that the, um, each one of the resources, the SQL Server, the Cosmos DB, the storage, all of them actually get their own uh, private DNS zone. Okay? And they're going to get, and you'll see a slightly different URL. And what happens is automatically, uh, Azure will pick that up if you, if you tell Azure to do this. Azure will pick that up and will actually create their own CNAME record for the public uh, FQDN, the public domain name, uh, map that to the private domain name, which in turn is mapped to the IP address, which may sound a little bit complex, but it's not too bad. Now, one thing to note with this, okay, one thing to note with all of this is that setting up the private IP, setting up uh, that, that private service endpoint does not in and of itself actually uh, remove the public endpoint from your services. So all of these services by default will still have a public endpoint. And what you need to do is you need to, in conjunction with setting up your private service endpoint is you need to set up the firewall rules so that all traffic is only allowed over that endpoint. And one thing that you can tell that this is still a little bit evolving is because the way that you do that for different services is a little bit different, right? And I'm gonna take you through all that. I'm gonna take you through all that pretty soon here. Uh, but I do wanna point that out is that, okay, the idea of the public, uh, the private endpoint, very simple. The idea of the private endpoint is to connect these platform services into a virtual network so that you can access them locally. Okay? And then the other part of that is that they will get a private IP address, but in most cases, uh, you will need to play some DNS games uh, in order to make sure that you're still connecting to them by their public uh, DNS name. Okay. Also, even though you have this private IP through this private service uh, endpoint, and it's also called a private link, okay, you still are going to need to set up some firewall ruling to prevent the external access. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but those are the key factors. Now we're gonna jump back over to, if I can get this right, there we go. Jump back over there. We should be, yes, we are in fact sharing the right screen. Okay, that's all the bouncing back and forth we have. All right, so I've actually talked about platform endpoints and service endpoints. So, Let's jump right over here. Okay. Now there is some terminology that you need to be aware of when you're looking at service endpoints, right? And again, these are platform service endpoints. You're gonna hear service endpoints, which were originally called public service endpoints, but they seem to have kind of removed the word public uh, from that uh, particular nomenclature. It's still there and the, the functionality is still the same. They just don't call it public uh, service endpoints anymore. Okay, so I can actually set up a connection between a, uh, a virtual network and a service such as SQL Server without creating that private IP address. And that's what the service endpoint really is. All right, now a service endpoint is still gonna use a public IP address, but it's going to route within Azure. So if I set up an endpoint, it's gonna route within Azure, even though it's still a public uh, endpoint. Okay, if I just set up service endpoints, that is non-transitive. It does not require any DNS configuration because it's still going out to the same public IP address. Uh, you do need to have what's called a subnet endpoint. Okay, with a subnet endpoint, what that does essentially, and this is what technically is a service endpoint, what that does essentially is says, okay, this subnet can take advantage of service endpoints and can route uh, through Azure to the public endpoints rather than going actually out to the public internet. And uh, you will also set up a firewall rule on the service, all right? And the subnet endpoint and the firewall rule are really uh, part and parcel. They, they, they go together and you can create them at the same time, which is what I'm going to do in the demonstration. Now, the private endpoints, when you set up a private endpoint, 
All right, the private endpoint is going to use a private IP address. The routing is going to be within the network, just like it would be if it was another virtual machine. Uh, they are transitive in that if I've got a peering uh, connection. Now, right now for peering, if you're familiar with Azure peering, uh, the private endpoints are only transitive for uh, regional peerings. They're not transitive for global peerings. In other words, I can peer between virtual networks in the same region, and it'll pick that up automatically. Uh, but I cannot peer and have this connectivity work, the private endpoint work, across uh, the global peering. So if I'm peering between two different regions, that's not going to work with private endpoints. However, uh, what you can do is you can set up a VPN gateway because it will traverse a VPN gateway. So that's a way around that. Uh, you do need uh, some DNS configuration, whether you're going to let uh, Microsoft do that, let Azure do that, or you can do it yourself. Okay, And it creates what's called a private link. Honestly, the private link doesn't matter that much, uh, in term, but it's, it's terminology. You just think about it as private endpoints, but you're going to see the term private link. So I think it's worthwhile uh, to take a look at what that is. Okay. All right. And that's all of the background. Now we get to get into some demonstration. All right, so I'm going to demonstrate uh, private service endpoints. And here's what we have. <clears throat> so I'm going to start out. And uh, I've got a uh, Cosmos DB, a uh, Azure SQL database, and Azure Blob Storage. All of these are actually in support of a web app. Okay. Now, initially, the web app, we'll draw a little bit on here. Okay, so initially the web app is just connected straight through to all three of these. Now you see why I wanted to use my uh, other drawing tool. Okay, uh, but what we want to do is we actually want to set this up so that these all have private endpoints. Oh, by the way, I also have a virtual machine in here that we'll just take a look at because it's there, it's in the subnet, it works out, okay? Now, uh, the other thing I'm gonna do, okay, is I'm actually going to do a little more with the web app, okay? I'm actually going to set up a connection between the web app and a subnet, okay? And when I do that, the reason I'm gonna do that is because typically, when you think about setting up a private endpoint, right, that's for incoming requests. Now, uh, you know, certainly, of course, they're going to be able to respond to those requests, right? But with my web app, my web app needs to make requests. So I need to tie the web app more tightly uh, to a subnet. And in fact, the web app has to have its own subnet. And that's actually not even though it's a little bit different, it's not completely um, inconsistent with the way that Azure works. If I'm using an application gateway, if I'm using a VPN gateway, both of which have the ability to kind of, you know, be the source of traffic, those also need their own, uh, their own subnet, right? So that's what we have, All right? So in any case, we're going to go from having all of those uh, on their own uh, to having them all connected. But we're also uh, going to need to use uh, private DNS. And because again, uh, really all three of those, I'm going to use uh, encrypted communication and the encryption certificates are uh, tied to the actual external name. But I'll show you also, you can see how it's actually, uh, even though I may be connecting to the uh, public DNS name, it's actually going through and resolving that to the private IP address, which is really all you want. All right, big picture, what are we gonna do here? All right, I'm gonna go through and configure. First, I'm gonna show you that the application works and uh, it's currently set up. Then I'm gonna go through and start tying things down. So through SQL Server, Cosmos DB, and the storage account, I'm gonna add a private endpoint and I'm gonna set up firewall rules. I'm going to go a little farther than that in SQL Server. And here's where uh, you can tell it's, it's not a perfectly consistent experience because SQL Server has a few things that are different 
Uh, biggest thing is I'm going to completely disallow public access. Now, when I disallow public access, what that means is that the only access that that server is going to allow is over its private endpoint. And, uh, and then Cognos TV, I'm actually doing uh, pretty much the same thing. I'm unchecking an option uh, to accept connections from within public Azure data centers. Okay. Uh, with the web app, uh, there's a couple things I need to do. One, I need to integrate it with the network. Uh, and two, I need to add a couple of environment variables to that uh, web app, all right? And that is what we have. So without further ado, we're gonna get started up here. Okay. And in fact, let's get started up, I'm gonna switch screens over to, yeah. That way I'm not looking sideways as badly. Okay, uh, here is, so I'm gonna cheat a bit. So, so good at planning. All right, uh, here's what we have now. I've got uh, deployed, when you see the resources that I currently have deployed, uh, essentially all of the elements, I've got an app service and an app service plan. I've got Cosmos DB, uh, the disk network interface, network security group, those are all just for the VM. And now I have created three private DNS zones. All right, notice the naming, private link.blob.core.windows.net. If you're familiar with storage, you probably recognize blob.core.windows.net. Uh, in storage, of course, I mean in Azure. Uh, and then I've got private link.database.windows.net. That's for my Azure SQL database. And then private link.documents.azure.com. That's for my Cosmos DB database. Okay. Um, there's nothing in those right now. Okay. Uh, and then I've got the public IP address. That's just for my VM. I've got a uh, SQL database, a SQL server, a storage account, a virtual machine, and a virtual network. Okay? And if I look at the virtual network right now, really not that much connected to it. And this will change. All right, so right now I've just got my virtual machine associated with it, and I've got a network security group associated with the default uh, what is subnet. I couldn't think of the word subnet. I've got it associated with the default subnet. Okay. Now I'm going to go up here, and we'll just take a quick look at what this web app is. All right, so here's my incredibly complex web app. First, it pulls a list of courses from a SQL database. And then I can pull up a description of the course, including uh, the videos. Right? And uh, I also have an image. Now that image is actually being provided by the web app. Uh, the web app is going to a storage account uh, and it's actually streaming uh, the image from the storage account. I'll tell you why that is. It's actually not my absolute preferred method, and there are other ways that this could be done. But for this example, it's fine. We're not going to scale and have to worry about it. All right. Uh, this data, by the way, the uh, description and the videos, that is coming out of Cosmos DB. So I've got this combination of SQL Server, uh, Cosmos DB, and uh, a storage account, all of which is tied through this web app. All right. Now, I'm going to start breaking this, all right? So I'm going to go in and actually I'm going to leave that there. I've got multiple dashboards open because each of these steps may take a while uh, and sort of sometimes depends, all right? So I'm going to go in first and we'll have these going simultaneously so you're not just waiting around for it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my Azure Cosmos DB account and in my Azure Cosmos DB account, I've got this private endpoint connections. Okay. And, ah, interesting, that was the wrong one. Yeah. That was already done, had these backwards. You will, you will not even know what I just did there. All right, let's try that one more time. 
Here we go. Private endpoint connections. There, there are none. Whew. Good thing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and set a private endpoint. Now, uh, one thing to note, like I said, I may misstep slightly here, and I'll show you where. And I, I decided to go ahead and do this intentionally because um, it's just easier graphically. Uh, if I was doing this in production, I would do all this configuration, most likely through a uh, template, but at a minimum through some PowerShell or some Azure CLI. But in any case, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to say C, CDB, EP for endpoint, and put this in East US. And then next is the resource. And even though it's on a Cosmos DB account, this interface is really genericized, so they don't pre-populate it, which is fine. So we'll say, all right, I want database accounts. And there's my database account. And the type, in this case, is SQL, because right now, the uh, SQL API for Cosmos DB is the only one of their APIs that supports private endpoints. Next is configuration. Oh, good. It is going to let me pick it right. should be OK. All right, so I'm going to put this in a virtual network. And I'm actually going to put this directly in the default subnet. I'm going to integrate with private DNS. And I'm going to pick this private DNS, which is in the same, um, in the same resource group. Also, that private DNS is already. Uh, configured and linked into my virtual network. So we'll go ahead and create that. And by the way, if you have any questions while I'm going through this, please don't hesitate to throw a question in the Q&A. All right, next. I'm going to go in. And so I've done it for Cosmos DB. And I'm really going to do exactly the same thing now uh, for SQL Server. So this is. This is part one, setting up the private endpoints. So I'm going to go to SQL Server and go through literally the exact same process. The private endpoint is going to go in webinar demo. It's going to be SQL EP. For some reason, Microsoft always thinks I want to go to Central US, even though I literally, well, not quite always, but 95% of the time I'm East US. All right, and again, same kind of thing. I do have to pick this, so we'll go down here to SQL Servers. And the resource, move that guy. And the target, again, notice there's only one, one option here, SQL Server, which is fine. Okay, and we're gonna put that in the default subnet. We're gonna integrate with a DNS zone, but we're going to pick the right DNS zone. And create that. Okay, and so now, step three, same thing for my storage account. Right to that one. All right, and again, I know it's getting a little bit uh, boring here, but there's a slight difference on this one. Very exciting. Uh, private endpoint, uh, SAP, again, yes, in fact, I want that in East US. Resource type, all right, soft storage, storage accounts. Resource, my storage account. And then, hey, we have some differentiation here, very exciting. All right, uh, these are all different target subtypes. I'm working with blobs, so that's what I want. Okay. And again, I want that in the default subnet. And I want to integrate that with the private link.blob.core.windows.net. It's in the private DNS sense. Now, I went through this a little bit quickly. If you're watching, you'll notice that each one of these is different. I've got three different private DNS zones set up, but uh, each one of these services can only be associated with one of them because that's really the, if you will, DNS suffix that they use, right? And so for blob storage, uh, the DNS suffix is going to be private link.blob.core.windows.net instead of the normal blob.core.windows.net. 
All right, so I'm gonna do that a little bit quickly. I wanna make sure that that's clear. And create. All right, so in terms of setting up the actual private endpoints, that's it. I've set up all three private endpoints. And the Cosmos DB takes forever always. Uh, SQL Server looks like that's ready. And uh, as is my storage. So I'm going to go back to SQL Server. And let's set up some firewalls and virtual networks. All right, so there's a couple things that I want to do here. First of all, uh, I'm going to straight away deny uh, public network access. Okay? But I'm going to add a virtual network. So this is really critical. This is the second part of uh, this whole process. Okay? And uh, what I'm going to do is say, OK, I'm going to leave that name because I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, webinar VNet, and uh, I'm going to put this in actually web app. Make sure that's right. Ah, that was not the right one. There we go. Okay. Virtual network webinar VNet default. I don't default. Okay. There we go. All right. So I am adding webinar vnet default. Oh, I know why. OK, now this gets a little bit uh, problematic. It's not a huge problem, but you will get uh, this error here for a while uh, because what happens is it thinks that I have enabled this, but I really haven't. Let's uh, close this and let's see if we can't get that to work again. That is a bit of a bug. Okay, it's saying it is enabled. And now it's updating it. Okay, that is cranking through. Okay. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to flip back because I just realized that I did miss something. I think. I forgot to create. Yes, I did forget to create a subnet. Okay. Let's keep that for now. And by the way, I can actually add the endpoints. In fact, I will do that if I go in here. Um, I can add service endpoints. So that was SQL Server. I'll go ahead and add a SQL Server endpoint to it, and that will create the endpoint for the subnet. Again, there's two parts. There's the endpoint and there's the link to it. All right. My Cosmos DB is still processing. Okay. And I'm going to go back to my SQL Server. And I'm going to add. That still doesn't see it yet. OK. But uh, I should end up with both of the subnets here. All right. And now my storage is good. Got the private endpoint for my storage. So I'll go back to my storage account. And I'm now going to set up my firewall and virtual networks for the storage account. And again, each one of these is a little bit different here. Okay, so I'm going to say, you know what, I want to select networks. And essentially what that does, as soon as I hit select networks, that's going to clamp down on the endpoint. So, okay, I'm going to go webinar vnet. 
and I want both of these. Now this says that these are not enabled. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable them. And then that takes a bit of time as well, all right? But that's really the setup that I need to do for my resources. I go through and I set the private, uh, the private endpoint connection. And I go ahead and second part of that is I have to set up the firewall rules and, and they take a little while and that's why I've already got this ready. It's going to be a bit of a, what I like to call a cooking show demo. Okay. All right. So I've gone through and I've set those up. Now there is one other thing that I need to do. All right. And that is I need to set up my web app. Let's go ahead and put that up there. So I'm going to get my web app. And I'm going to go to networking for my web app. And I am going to configure my web app. Okay. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to configure my VNet configuration. Okay. And what this is doing, you'll see a term, and I actually went over this fairly quickly. Uh, at the subnet level, there's an option to say that I want this subnet delegated to a service. And that's really what I'm doing right here. I'm doing it from the uh, service in side, in this case, the web app. And, and I'm saying, okay, I want to take over, I want the web app to take over a uh, subnet, really, in a virtual network, and really pretty much manage that subnet. Okay? And, and so that way, if it needs to scale out or scale up or scale that, scale out or scale in, those are the right words, uh, it can do that. All right, so in any case, uh, I'm doing this uh, from this side, and I'm saying, you know what, I want, Oh, we've got to find the right one here. Yeah, that was the right one. Good. Got it on the first try. Okay, so I'm going to associate this. So the only problem with this is because I, I made sure this was done a couple of times. Should have done it in another region. Uh, I, I couldn't really tell which one was which, but I've already uh, done this with the other virtual network. So this is the only one that would work. Okay, notice, by the way, that... I can't use default uh, because it's not empty or it's already been delegated. Okay? And so that is setting up the delegation. And that actually happens pretty quickly. Okay? Now, the next thing uh, that I need to do, okay, there are on my web app, okay, the web app by default isn't going to want to, even though it's got this private endpoint, it's still got a public endpoint, it doesn't want to go through the name resolution that's associated with the subnet. So I have to kind of force it to do that, right? And you don't, under all circumstances, need to do everything I'm about to do. There's only two steps anyways, but it doesn't hurt to do it. And I'm going to add two configuration settings. These actually surface within the web app as environment variables, okay? I'm going to take one, which is going to be telling the DNS server, or telling the website what DNS server to use. Let's say website DNS server. And that's going to be, and these, these are, by the way, static. That it will always be that. That's just the internal DNS server that your virtual network uses. And then I have to tell it uh, to use that with another environment variable easily set up through my application settings. Website VNet route all, so just route everything out through the VNet and hit OK. okay. And again, the reason I need to do that is because my web app is actually uh, going to make requests, right? All the other services are sitting there listening for requests, right? So they don't have to be as proactive about DNS as your app service does. All right, now what I'm gonna do, that, that is all the configuration that you need, okay? Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you from, this was already done, all right? So I already have this set up and uh, I wanna show you first of all, let's uh, sort this. Okay, so I've got an app service plan, my app service, I've got Cosmos DB. Again, this is deployed from exactly the same template 
Uh, it's just it has more stuff now because I've, I've added those things. Uh, I've got my DNS zones. I've got my endpoints. I've got my SQL database, my storage account, my virtual machine. Okay. Now, if I go to these private DNS zones, can't bump that up just a bit here. Uh, you can see that I've got this I need webinar uh, 20, 201011SA, and it has this IP address 10.0.0.8. Okay? And I can see the same thing for all of my private DNS zones. Each one of those is going to have just one entry right now. And you can centralize that so you don't need three new. Uh, private DNS zones every time you're doing this, or you don't need a new private DNS zone for each service. You can connect it up to a different private DNS zone, but you have to make sure that that private DNS zone is actually linked to your virtual network. And uh, this is not, I'm not going to go deep into private DNS zones. Very cool. Uh, it is a little bit of work though. Okay. Let's see if we can get this running. And I'm going to go browse. And there we go. Okay, so it's coming up. And one thing I want to point out here is notice this web app IP. And, and I forgot to show you that on the first one, but it was the public IP address. This is actually the private IP address of the, of the application, of the web app. And, and uh, if you, if, in case you don't believe me, hopefully you do, but just in case you don't. Let's see here. Okay. And this is the query that's building that. And basically what I do is I, I pull the data from courses and then I threw in uh, an extra uh, client net address, uh, which is an internal function for SQL Server, not really that critical. But the point is, SQL Server is seeing that as coming from a private IP address, which is pretty cool. And as I click on these others, takes a moment, but there's my data, okay? All of that data is coming through on private IP addresses, okay? So, and now the cool thing is, I did not actually have to change any of the settings in the web app itself as far as connections. Now, first of all, I will tell you, this is a terrible way to do it. Uh, I did not use security best practices uh, on the data because this is sensitive data. It should be stored in Key Vault or better yet, I should be using Azure AD, but that's way outside the scope of this, okay? But if I go to my CDB Connect, which is my Cosmos DB, okay, I can see my account endpoint that is the public DNS name. Okay, now the actual DNS name would be iNewWebinar 2010.11-cdb.privatelink.documents.azure.com. That's actually where it is going. But again, that's being handled internally by my network DNS, my, my built-in DNS. All right, now the only couple other things here to uh, take a quick look at. If I go down to my virtual network, and uh, what you'll notice here with the virtual network is that there are actually uh, quite a number of new endpoints. So I've got uh, CDB Connect, uh, a NIC, okay, two different IP addresses, I've got a SQL endpoint, I've got a storage endpoint, and, uh, and I've got, uh, these were other tests that I did, okay, now that are still there. But uh, you can see that it's giving out local IP addresses for these different items. All right, uh, a couple other things to take a quick look at, and then, we are done. Again, I'm only seeing one question. Please, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. I'm going to go in to the console for the web app. So I'm actually connecting directly to the web app machine right now. 
Okay. And what I want to do on this web app machine is I want to use a tool called name resolver. And I'll zoom in on this. Hopefully I'll be able to zoom in on this. So I want to resolve a name. And the name that I want to resolve is, let's do it for my Cosmos DB. Okay, so I'm going to take this guy, which unfortunately I cannot just uh, copy. So I'm going to put this over here so I can read that. Okay. And this is IME 10. No, that's not right. That was the wrong, still the wrong one. Strike two. I will get this. There we go. I need webinar. I need webinar 2010-11 CDB dot documents dot Azure dot com. Okay. And I run that. And hopefully you can see this. Let's see if it's going to, oh, it did bump up there a little bit for me. Okay. Notice uh, that I've got the address here of 10.0.0.5. That is the internal address for that. And it has the alias. This is actually just the CNAME record. That's how it works, right? So uh, I need webinar 20. Uh, 10.11-cdb.documents.azure.com uh, has a CNAME record that links it over to the private link, which links it to the actual IP address, which again, can be a little bit complex, but uh, not too terrible. And let's see if I can get the SQL here without looking. So on the old, well, and there we go. All right, and so that comes up pretty quickly. You'll notice that, again, same thing. That is my public DNS name, which I have to use. And then that is uh, resolving to a private IP address. And then uh, what's making that happen, again, is that CNAME record that's in that private DNS zone. Now, actually, I'm sorry, the CNET record uh, is CNAME record, excuse me. The CNAME record is not in the private DNS zone. The CNAME record is actually being handled automatically by Azure, by the built-in uh, DNS server that I'm using for my virtual network. Now, it's going to pop into a virtual machine and show you the same thing, but it's really just exactly the same thing. Uh, the virtual machine is on the same network, so I don't think that's necessarily going to be a uh, great use of time. All right, so wrapping all this up. What are the big picture items here? All right, first of all, uh, if you're going to use any kind of platform service, whether it's you know database, file storage, uh, really anything that is platform service, by default, that's gonna have a public endpoint. And by default, that's gonna be accessible. What you wanna do is you really wanna lock that down. Right? You wanna lock it down by doing two things. First of all, you want to create a private service endpoint, which is going to create a private link, which is going to give a private IP address for your service in a virtual network. Okay? Uh, and then the second part of that is that you need to set up your firewall rules so that only that virtual network or any other appropriate virtual networks can connect to that resource. Okay? I will tell you that this is something that's in a little bit of transition uh, and the concepts are there, but uh, every time I go and do this, I have to practice just a little bit because it changed things just a little bit because this is truly evolving. It's, it's in production, it's in general availability and you should use it. I'm just saying, if you're watching this, if you're watching this on YouTube six months from now, uh, it's possible that the steps you go through might be slightly different than mine, okay? Uh, now for the demo, I did, kind of go through some of it and then skipped ahead a bit. Uh, the reason I skipped ahead a bit was because it was just a timing issue and I didn't want to wait uh, for all of those other systems to finish up. But uh, what I showed you at the end, I'd gone through exactly the same process uh, for. And I know that because as I went through the process, I, I wrote it down on a sheet that I was cheating off of uh, to make sure I didn't miss anything. 
All right, that uh, concludes the presentation. I do see uh, that we've got some good questions here. I've got four questions and, and it looked like something came up on the private chat as well. Okay. All right. Um, and it looks like on the private chat, someone said, excuse me, uh, on the chat, if, if you've got a question, if you could just pop that into uh, the Q&A, and then I will answer it from there. All right, so the first question is coming from Thomas Winther. Uh, does it come with a price per private service endpoint? Okay, that is a great question. And let's look at Azure Private. Pricing. Okay. Pricing as a private link. All right. And so here's what you have. Okay. The private endpoint is one cent per hour in US dollars. And data processed in and out is one cent per gigabyte. Right. So, uh, you know, you are going to have to be aware of this, but, you know, if my math is right, uh, that's ten dollars per terabyte of data in and out, right? Plus, you know, twenty-four cents a day uh, to actually run the private endpoint. So yes, there is a cost, but I would say that is a, a pretty nominal cost. Hopefully, Thomas, that answers your question. Uh, the next question is: This webinar being recorded for on-demand viewing? Absolutely yes. And once I'm done here, I'll have uh, Brittany. I'll have. She will pop back in. I have no choice there. Uh, but Brittany will pop back in and she will uh, let you know about what's going to happen as far as how you're going to be able to get to the recording. Okay, so that's a yes. And that was from Jay. Uh, another question from Thomas. Uh, if I disable uh, or firewall the public endpoint of the service, can I still reach it from on-prem via express route public peering? Or would it be preferable to also reach the service to be a private endpoint and private peering? So in that case, that's a great question. Uh, what you're going to have to do is set up private peering for, or what is now called Microsoft peering for that. Because again, uh, the, you know, the public peering is going to that public endpoint and that's not what you want. You want to go ahead and make sure that you're routing. Also, quite frankly, you're probably going to need to do a little bit of DNS configuration for the on-prem. It's absolutely doable, all right? And it is supported and there is documentation for it, uh, but that's the simple answer, okay? Is uh, you can definitely get to it over Express Route, uh, but you're gonna wanna do that through a uh, Microsoft Peering connection. Okay, great, uh, that was from Thomas. Uh, got a question from uh, Stephen Fitzpatrick. Hi, Tracy, when you use VNet integration on web app or function app to connect back to on-prem over express route. If it's not to be externally facing, would you use access restrictions on networking to secure it since they still have public IPs? If I'm understanding that question, the answer is yes. And, and you know, the, the private service endpoint is gonna give you that private IP address. It's going to allow you to connect to that platform service over that private connectivity, whether it's directly or through a peering relationship or even through a gateway relationship uh, in a transitive uh, environment. Okay? But uh, until you set up your networking restrictions uh, and then it's still accessible from the public endpoint. So if I uh, read that correctly, if I read your uh, question correctly, uh, then the answer is yes, you still have to do that. If I did not, please, if you wouldn't mind, put that, that question back in and I'll be happy to answer it. All right, the next question that I have here, uh, and it is the last question that I see, so if you've got another question you wanna ask, please do not hesitate to do so. Okay. And uh, does private endpoint is isolated from other subnet and need to be natted to outside in reference to firewall? Uh, that is a question from Mohammed. Again, I, I may have mumbled through that. I'll read it again. Does the private inter is the private internet isolated? Is the private endpoint? Sorry, third time's a charm. Is the private endpoint isolated from other subnets and need to be natted to outside and referenced to firewall rule? No. 
It does not. And in fact, some interesting things. Okay. Uh, your, I didn't have to set up any map. Like the process that you saw me go through, even though I kind of skipped to the end, uh, I didn't really skip to the end. I just didn't wait for it all to finish. Um, that process is exactly the process I used uh, to transform my web app that was initially going against the public endpoints to going to the private endpoints. Okay. Uh, and so again, the simple answer to that is that you set up your private endpoint slash private link, and then you set up on the service, uh, you set up your firewall rules. Now, one thing that's really important is that your uh, you, uh, possible gotcha is that your uh, private endpoints, your private links do generate NICs. However, you cannot apply an NSG to the NIC of a private endpoint. And uh, generally speaking, the private endpoint itself ignores an NSG that is set up on its subnet. Okay, So that is just something to be aware of. Uh, that you're going to, you know, if you want further control uh, beyond just, um, you know, what I've shown you, you want to be able to further segment out the traffic, um, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do that by, if you want to use NSGs, uh, by setting outbound NSGs on the other subnets to control traffic into the subnet where your uh, private IP addresses your private links are. Uh, one thing I would suggest, and I didn't do it this way because I kind of wanted to show you you don't have to. I would suggest that you segment or you segregate your private links, uh, put them into, now they can all go into one subnet, uh, but put them in a different subnet. And it's possible you may want to put them in different subnets so that you can set up different egress rules for, uh, or different outbound rules for NSGs for your main uh, subnets. All right. Okay. Um, does the entire, can the entire setup be automated uh, using Terraform? That is a fine question. One I do not have the precise answer for, and I will tell you why. Um, it can be up through the private links. These can be set up. Let me just uh, double check this. Yep, there we go. Pretty sure there was a template. Okay. And there. There's a bunch of them. I always like to go to this guy. And yeah, there we go. So as far as um, automating, you can definitely automate it via an Azure template. But what I'm not sure of, frankly, is whether or not you can automate it via Terraform, right? Because Terraform is managed completely differently and it really just depends on whether or not they have integrated uh, the, uh, that part of the networking API, the ARM API. Hopefully that makes sense. Great question. All right, that was the last question that I see. If there are no other questions, we'll call it a day. If you do have another question, Throw one in there. If, if you're afraid it's going to take too long to type, uh, just put a quick question mark up there in the Q&A first, and I'll wait. Otherwise, uh, we are good. So, Brittany, looks like we're good if you want to take over and, and close us out.